Do you have a pile of RAM chips getting you down? Today we're going to use an Arduino and build a couple of tools that let you tell a working DRAM chip from a faulty one. Hello and welcome back to Noel's Retro Lab. If you've seen some of my other repair videos in this channel, you know that dynamic RAM chips tend to fail a lot certainly more than other components. On some platforms, we have good diagnostics tools that will narrow down the faulty chips. But sometimes diagnostics aren't available on that computer, or maybe even the computer is in such bad state that those tools won't even work correctly. And when that happens, trying to tell a working from non-working RAM chip by hand is tedious at best. So today we're gonna look at two different ways to test DRAM chips using an Arduino board. We're going to start testing 4164 DRAM chips. So let's have a really quick look at their basic operation. The chip has 64 kilo bits of memory. Since we can access each bit independently, it needs 16 bits of addressing space. But when you look at the pinout, you see that it only has eight bits for addresses. That's because these kind of chips expect you to feed the addresses in two parts, eight bits for the row address and then turn the RAS signal, and then eight bits for the column address and turn on the CAS signal. Once you do that, if the right signal is on, it will take the value of the data in and save it in the cell. Or if the right signal was off, it will put the contents of that bit in data out. And that's pretty much it. So how can we use the Arduino to make sure that the RAM chip is working correctly? The easiest way is to connect it to the Arduino and have the Arduino write values to it, read them back and make sure they were the same. And what values should those be? Well, we could write all zeros and read them back, but what happens if one of the bits is faulty and always returns zero? Okay, so we could follow that up with another pass and we write all ones and read them back. That will catch that previous case, but it might miss some other faults that maybe return the last bit written, not the one you're trying to read. You could almost always come up with some weird failure state that will make a certain test pattern pass, but as long as it's very rare, that's fine. So in addition to all zeros and all ones, I'm going to write alternating zeros and ones, and then alternating ones and zeros. And finally, for good measure, I'll write zeros and ones randomly to all the memory, and then read them back and make sure they match what I wrote in the first place. If it passes that, chances are the chip is going to work correctly. I'll put all this code in GitHub, and you'll have a link in the description. This is not a thorough test at all, but it's more of a sample for people interested in interfacing an Arduino with similar DRAM chips, so it's a good starting point. And to build this, we're going to need an Arduino board, a breadboard, a zip socket, and lots and lots of cables. And here's the final result. It's a total rat's nest of cables everywhere but it's just a proof of concept. It's just to see how we can do the testing with the Arduino. So let's go ahead and give it a try. Here I have a 4164 chip and oh God, even just putting it here, it's, <laughs> it's a challenge with all these cables. And let's see if it works. If so, we should be getting a yellow light while it's testing. And since the test has multiple faces, the light will blink very slightly in between those faces. That way we have some idea of progress. And then at the end of the five faces, we'll either get red failure or green success. Okay, that blinked, that was one of them. There you go. And there you go. This t it tells us that this particular chip is good. And let's try with this other one. I believe this one is not working correctly, but we'll find out in a second. And for this, I can just press the reset button on the Arduino and it will start the test from the top. Hmm, I'm surprised that it hasn't rejected the chip yet. Okay, yeah. So right away, it failed it. One limitation of this kind of approach for testing RAM chips is that we have to remove them from the board. That's less than ideal because desoldering chips is time consuming and it could even damage the chips or the board itself, but there isn't a good way around it beyond running diagnostics on the computer itself. As I found an experiment a while back, I tried creating a contraption to test DRAM chips in place, but because the voltage rails and the signals are connected to the rest of the computer, you end up waking up the rest of the chips and it makes it individual testing of the chips impossible. 
That approach might work by lifting the VCC pin for the DRAM chip, but trying to desolder and lift a single pin is almost harder and it's pretty easy to break off. So for now, we'll just have to test the chips once they've been removed from the board. So this is working quite well, but it's a pain to use. The cables are constantly getting in the way to put in the chip. It's really hard to put the lever up and down because it hits the LEDs. And really, this is hard to store. And we could take it down, but then if we reassemble it every time, it's several minutes to reassemble. So it's not exactly practical. We could make our own PCB where we can connect all the elements and solder them in place. That would make it much more useful. But then I thought, someone must have done this already, and maybe they even added support for other DRAM chips. And that's when Patreon supporter Leo Albanese told me about one available on eBay that tests both 4164 and 4116s, which sounded great. And it was even so kind as to buy for me to test and make a video about it. So let's see how it compares to our homemade cable monster. And so this is what you get when you order the DRAM tester kit. So right off the bat, I can definitely appreciate that it comes with some instructions. Sometimes you get kits that are just, here are the components and you go figure out how to do it, or you know, hopefully you go to their website or their project page. I might appreciate even going beyond this and actually getting a bill of materials just so I can check each of them and make sure that I have the right components. So these are all the components out of their packaging. It even comes with a little rubber feet, so that's nice. It comes obviously with the Arduino Nano itself, and the rest seemed uh, pretty simple through whole components, except for a couple SMD components. So um, there is a little bit of SMD soldering involved, so that might be a great way for somebody who doesn't have SMD experience. Okay, so let's go ahead and build it. I get to use this device to put the pins of the chip so that they fit, hopefully, yep, straight in. Very nice. And now for the cutting part, which is not great because these pins are usually thicker and harder. So they can fly all over the place if you're not careful, including your eyes. And there you go. I think we got everything except for the SMD components. To clean things up, I have an anti-static brush and alcohol, lots of alcohol. And let's also put the rubber feet, of course. I actually just realized that the rubber feet are not long enough. Yeah, they're very, very shallow. So even the DC jack is sticking over it. So when I push there, hmm, I have those. They're definitely bigger. Oh yeah, those are nice and nice and big. If anything, the problem is I don't have a place to put them. <laughs> Okay, much, much better. Yeah, those were just too tiny. So let's test it. Without even reading the manual, it tells you very clearly here, it's nine volts and it's center positive, which means don't try to reuse your ZX Spectrum power supply. That one is one of the maybe somewhat odd ones that is center negative. So I'm going to use my bench power supply for this. 
I'm powering it on and I'm seeing 0 0.05 amps, so a very little draw, that's good. So let's just check a few voltages. Okay, so that's almost nine volts, 12 volts in there, five, minus five, okay, five in there. So that seems, initial check is fine. So let's reach into the box of DRAM. So these are 4164s over here. So let's try a 4164, which is the easier one for it to work because it's only using five volts. And this is where you need to be really careful. You need to always be thinking, is this a 4164 or 4116? So I need to remember 4164, larger number to the right. That kind of makes sense. And these are the kind that like that they're loose. So like that, and let's try testing it. I'm guessing the blinking is that it's thinking about it. Doesn't inspire me with confidence that the red one is on all the time. Now it stopped. But this one is still blinking. I don't know what that means. So I guess this is telling us that this chip is good. Okay. You know, one thing that would probably help a lot with feedback and it wouldn't add much at all to the cost is to add a, one of those nice little OLED screens. Actually, I have some in here, something like that, or, you know, or even, or even like that. And even if something like this just told you what percentage of the way the chip has been tested, I think that would help a lot with the kind of feedback because here you're starting to question, has it crashed? How long has it been? <laughs> Actually, before we even try the 4164, I'm going to reach into my box of shame with including fake chips that I need to test. And so in here, there will be plenty of defective 4164s. There you go, that's a 4164. That's another 4164. Oh, and I think I even have a bag of ones that I think were bad, but I wasn't really sure. So that could be interesting to sort through that bag and figure it out. Okay, so let's try a busted MT4164. Now the good thing about trying a faulty one is that if things are done correctly, it should just tell us that it's bad probably really quickly. We shouldn't have to wait 20 seconds. Boom, okay, yes, that's doing it correctly. This is so bad. Probably the very first read that I tried to do is like, okay, we're done. Okay, let's try another one. Another 4164. Boom, yes, bad. <laughs> oh, look, this one has to think some more. So this one, this one is interesting. Supposedly I marked it as faulty but right now it's passing. So maybe it's just like one cell that is bad. And it's doing this weird thing again. So it leaves the red light. Okay, this is excellent. It took a little while because it wasn't completely busted, but it had something that it eventually caught. So this is very good. But I don't like how the red LED stays on while you're doing a new test. That it's a little misleading. If, if it were up to me, I would just change it. So whenever you press the button, that's cleared, unless it has some different meaning. So in that bag of potentially faulted chips, I had two, four, six, eight of these. And these are interesting because they're not 4164s. They are listed as HM4864AP. So I should be able to test them as a regular 4164. Yeah, this is why I had them apart in a bag. I had not confirmed that they were all bad, but now I know those are for sure, and those are probably good enough. So I'm just gonna put them in my DRAM box. And those go back in the box. Okay, so let's try some 4116s. Okay, triple check in 4116, because if you put a, if you put a 4116 here, you're probably fine. But if you put a 4164 here, you have a barbecue.
Very nice. And yes, that was definitely faster. And let's actually try this one. This is a 4164, but modded to fit as a 4116. Great. So that one worked too. And so for a final test, let's try this 4116 that was in the faulty chips box. I have no idea where this came from, but let's see if it really is not working. Okay, right away, clearly, clearly not working. So a little bit of a problem is that when you push one of those buttons, it tends to tip the whole thing. And that's because I put that rubber feet a little bit in because of the um, solder joints in there. So I thought of putting another one right there, but those resistors are in a really bad place. So not liking that design too much. Maybe if I put one right there, it will probably, yeah, I think it will prevent, prevent it from doing that. I think that's worth doing. much better. Yeah, this one still does it a little bit, if I'm not careful. This one is good. Okay, that's better. So far, the DRAM tester has been pretty good and has been meeting all my expectations. There are some things that are less than ideal, though. One thing that surprised me is the lack of protection on the Arduino. We're clearly going to be testing all sorts of faulty chips, and when chips fail, they can do all sorts of nasty things. Most of the time, they simply don't write or read the correct bits, and that will be fine. But sometimes, internal shorts cause the output pins to go to VCC or ground all the time. And that would probably be fine for the 4164 DRAM chips, because all the voltages there are between 0 volts and 5 volts. So I think the Arduino can handle that on its pins. However, the 4116 also has minus 5 volts and plus 12 volts, which are much more dangerous voltages to feed into the Arduino. Do I know for a fact that those voltages would damage the Arduino? I don't, it's just a guess. It doesn't feel right to put those voltages, so I suspect it would actually end up damaging it. But if somebody who knows the internals of the Arduino knows otherwise, definitely let me know. I admit it's probably not hugely likely to get a short to one of those voltages, but I imagine it's possible. So I'm surprised there isn't some form of protection to prevent the Arduino from blowing up if something like that goes wrong. One pretty big drawback of this tester is its cost. It sells on eBay for 2660 euros, which that seems reasonable, plus 2140 euros for shipping to Europe, probably significantly less in the UK, and I suspect more than that in other parts of the world. So that's a total of 48 euros shipped. That's not exactly cheap for a convenience tool. For that amount of money, you could almost consider buying a ZX Spectrum board and some kind of RAM board and install ZX Diagnostics and do your RAM tests in there. As a plus, you could even test eight chips at the same time. But it's possible that my expectations are off. Let's look at the cost of materials you get. The PCB, you can probably make five of those for under 20 shipped, so let's just say four euros each. The Arduino Nano and pin headers, it's about five euros shipped. Two zip sockets are about four euros total, and the rest of the components, if I'm gonna be really generous, I'm gonna say four euros. So that's a total of 17 euros. So that's a lot more palatable, and that's not that far from the 26 euros it sells for on eBay, which seems like a reasonable charge to put everything together in the form of a kit and give you instructions and all of that. The killer is the shipping charge on top of that. Okay, no big deal. So we'll do like we've done with other projects before. We'll print the PCBs ourselves, order a few components, program the Arduino, and build it ourselves. And that's where one of the bigger problems with this project comes in. Unfortunately, this is not an open source project. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think that every project needs to be open source. There's definitely room for commercial projects that reward their designers for their efforts. The difference here is that this feels like such a basic project that I don't understand what the resistance is to make it open source. You can see the simple circuit at a glance and they even have a layout image on their website. The programming on the Arduino is probably extremely simple and someone could probably replicate that in half an hour, kind of like the one I did earlier. I really believe this project will be much better off as open source. I think a lot of people would still choose to buy the pre-made kits like this one. And then at the same time, it may spark lots of changes and improvements from other people contributing to the project. 
I could see someone adding support for that OLED screen like we talked about earlier, or a special test that checks if our 4164 chip would work with a ZX Spectrum upper bank because those can use chips with one faulty bit. I actually reached out to PCB geeks through their website to ask for clarifications on the protection of the Arduino against short and whether they were considering open sourcing the PCB design or the firmware, but they never replied. Since I didn't buy it from them directly, I didn't reach out through them through eBay, but I see they have 100% feedback rating there, so they're clearly doing things right. So what's the final verdict on this one? Well, you can decide. It's clearly a working and capable DRAM test kit, and it's easy and fun to build. If you're not put off by the chip limitation, the price, and the lack of open source, then this is probably the project for you. If it's not a good fit, I'm planning on reviewing other chip testers in the future. In the meanwhile, I'll definitely continue using this tester for the majority of the RAM chips. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Any comments, let me know as usual, and I'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.